right at about verse 2, we have a discussion that is happening between God and Gideon um, in Judges chapter 7. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Gideon is one of those guys who's kind of like a chicken. He don't really want to go after <laughs> things. You know, he's a little scary cat. He won't be in the future of that. He, he will become a mighty man of God, but he didn't, didn't really want to go to this thing. So we start that right here in 7-2. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vow themselves against me, saying, mine own hand has saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remain ten thousand. This scripture is kind of a little funny because they say, Whoever is afraid, go home. And I, I've always thought that among soldiers, you know, showing fear is one of those weird deals that you shouldn't have. <laughs> and these 22,000 guys, I'm like, well, yeah, I'm afraid I'm going home. <laughs> and I think also, had it not been Gideon, who's the leader, he would have gone home also. <laughs> he just didn't have that choice. Verse 4, and the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, every one, that lappeth of the water with his tongue. As a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that bowed down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men, the lap will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man unto his place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, we pray, Father, for your anointing to be upon Oscar this morning. Father, that he would bring the word alive to us this morning. Father, that he would teach us, Father. Father, in your hand, Father, would be upon all of us today, Father, that we would be pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, let's silence the phones. We put in silencio sus teléfonos, por favor. So, I want to approach something today with Gideon, but it has to do with one of the most important questions you're going to ask yourself as a Christian, either as a minister, as a layman, or even a member of, of the body of Christ. We all have to answer this question. Gideon is being told that there is a huge battle. And God is going to handpick the group of people he wants to use. You know the, the rest of the story. You know how they come down to this 300. But get into the last verse of the passage that we read. God looks among the brave. There were 10,000 men there who were brave. Thank God for the brave. And then he gets to this small group of people, 300. Now he doesn't pick him. He doesn't say this one, that one, and that one. That's not how it goes. He actually says something different. He says the ones who take the water to their mouth, those are the ones that I want. Now it could have been probably like this, or it could have been like this, like uh, like it could have been on the on, on where you're 
laughing at it. Now, what that tells you with that particular occasion is that God is looking for men and women to do great things and the way that he goes to them is he chooses among the brave, those who will take the step, those who will stand up, yes. And then among them, to the higher level of people, is those who are not easily distracted. Let me, say, let me tell you what I'm saying. I've spoken on this before, and I want to go a little deeper on it. <clears throat> These guys had a need. They all were thirsty. And God put something in front of them. A big body of water. 10,000 people run to it. And some of them went down and put their mouth to the water. And that's how they were drinking. At that moment. At that second. At that time they were drinking. They were completely unprotected. And they were only thinking about fulfilling that need. Listen to it again. At that moment. Nothing else was happening. Nothing good or bad. The only thing that this man was zeroing, they were zeroing in on was to fulfill the need, which is to drink. Now, drinking water is necessary, so don't blame the guys. God made us in a way that we have to drink. So there is no, oh, they're sinning. Oh, they're doing something. They were not sinning. They were just fulfilling a need. But when God went to pick the 300, he picked the ones who were fulfilling the need without losing their focus. The focus was the war. They needed to fight. They were close in proximity with the enemy. They were not too far. They were camped out not too far. So these guys, these 300, were the ones who were never losing track of the fact that they needed to be warriors every moment of their life. Yeah. Amen. Great men of God and great women of God are picked by God that way. Not only out of the bravery of their heart and their boldness as they step into the battlefield, but they never use their need as an excuse to get distracted. Let me give you an example. Here is the Apostle Paul struggling as one of the mightiest men who has ever lived. Writing of half of the New Testament. If anybody had the right for people to keep him going and help him in the ministry, it would be him. For some reason, people didn't like Paul a whole lot. Maybe it was the way he preached. But also, there was this struggle telling them that they, he was not an apostle and that the apostles, and there was this whole deal going on with him. And so here's struggling the man of God. And he has a need. He also does not want to be a burden to the church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. And if I may, I may add something, this is not from God, this is me. There's also a little bit of you saying, you know what, I can take care of myself. No, not, not saying to God, not to God, to people. Because sometimes people begin to think, think of you like if you're some beggar in the street. Yeah. Paul says it in a couple of places. But what I just said is from me. But Paul goes to build tents with his hands. He's working hard hours. And in the middle of all that, he manages to write half of the New Testament. It, he wasn't a superhuman. He got tired, just like you. He did not have access to cars and things. Everywhere he went, he had to either walk or ride on a horse. He, he had to be even more tired than you ever have been. But And yet he will get to a city and begin that whole deal and work with his hands to provide so that he could preach. But the tent making never distracted him from the focus. We don't know Paul and well, he was a great tent maker. Man, those stands he made. They're still making them. I mean, he made some models. 
That was not what it was about. He made something, yes, but it was so that he could preach. The focus was on the call of God. Yes. Let me tell you something that is experiential from me. Again, I have seen more ministers and more godly men and women die in the altar of need than in any other altar. A man says, I need to provide for my children. And he puts down the call and heads out. Another one says, not yet, because I don't have a house yet. And he pursues after that. Do you think it's an accident that when God was invited and he gave us this, this beautiful parable, you know, and he says, go knock on people's doors to your tell this one and that one, that one said, Hey, you know what? <clears throat> I just bought a house. Can't go right now. Other one said, I just got uh, you know, a pair of oxen. I can't go right now. I just got married. No, I can't go right now. Because, you know, there's all kinds of things happening in marriage. And I don't mean bad things. I mean in the essence of all the responsibilities. It's no accident that God puts that in there because those are real needs. There are real needs. And in the process of it though, somebody said no to God. Yeah. Understand this, brothers and sisters. Those tensions are going to exist in your life. Every man here, every woman here who dedicated himself to the Lord, let me go back to the root of, uh, at the time that you were doing that, and you will tell me a testimony. You will tell me, you know what? I started struggling because I'm used to the paycheck. I'm used to the stuff. I, I'm used to the... This is <coughs> the guy who said, I, I need to run over here and drink some of this water, and for a moment, at least for a moment, I need to leave the call alone. What about those who are not called into the pulpit or called to be missionaries? There are many, 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 many who are not. But this is something that you will struggle with also. You will run to and fro and all of a sudden your job becomes more and more and more. You're working 70 hours a week because you're trying to build a business or trying to you know, you know, run, run something or trying to be the faithful person who is on salary. Salaries are always a trap. You know that. Whenever they tell you you're on salary, it means 70 hours. And yet when you find that person, you can see how his relationship with God is drying up, drying up, drying up. All of a sudden, his need has overtaken his relationship with God. And he has put his mouth to the water just to fulfill that need. It's not, you know, the Bible says this, he who doesn't work, let him not eat. The Bible also says, honor your father and your mother. And in those two things are beautiful passages. And yet, those passages come up against a wall. When the Lord says to somebody, let the dead bury the dead. He sounds like he's saying to, to, to abandon your dad and your mom. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is don't lose track of what you are here on this earth to do. Yeah. Don't lose track of that which you have made. When God chooses people to do great things, those are the ones who can choose. He chooses the one who do not get distracted even by a desperate need of their Heart. They need it. And yet they will put it on the altar and say, I'm going to fulfill it, God, even if it's little by little, but I'm not going to keep my, or take my eyes off of what I'm supposed to do in the Lord. Yeah. Stay whenever, listen to this, whenever, whatever takes your eyes off of the goal, it's too big now. It becomes an idol. Yeah. It can be something as simple as a sport or as complicated as a relationship. It can be something as little or insignificant as a fight with somebody who consumes your, your thoughts and your life or the high of a calling that, let, let, that tells you that the commitment to a church is bigger than your commitment to God. Yeah. Men and women of God, 
we need to understand that principle and the depth of those people who were doing that. That tension exists, and it will exist in you until the day you die. We all fight it. We all fight it. <laughs> Parents here can remember this, and I'll, I'll finish. I know you waved at me already. Uh, pa parents here could, 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 could think of this. Have you, you, do you remember when your child is wanting something and you know that the neighbors have it and God and your commitments to God have you doing something else? Well, that child doesn't understand that. All he understands is he wanted those Nikes for Christmas. He's eight. You can't give him a whole theological diatribe. You have to, but there is a choice that you make. That doesn't mean don't buy him. If God gives them to you, you just buy him. What I, what, what I try to say is this. <clears throat> is it taking your eyes off of the price? The price is Christ. Amen. Amen. And those boys, those 300, they would refuse to put it down even for a second. Whatever job you have, whatever business you have, whatever thing you have, whatever call you have, whatever church you have, whatever ministry you have, they should never be something that makes you take your eye off the price. Yeah. A laser-focused Christian is a powerful Christian. Who I feel that one. I got to tell you that. Yeah. Because I've seen people who don't even have a lot of talent. But they're so laser focused that it's scary. I know this person years and years back who wanted to learn how to play the guitar. He didn't sound very good. <laughs> and we are decent musicians. You know, we grew up in church. And so we kind of like, you know, we have a saying in Spanish which is patito feo. It's like the ugly duckling. He will show up and we'll be like, just ignore him. Maybe he goes away. <laughs> he will mess up when we were playing. I'd be like, oh, God. And he didn't ask us. He just showed up and would start playing with us. And we're like, who invited him? Not me. <sighs> you know, I used to give you a, 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 a good ending here. This brother became a powerful minister of the gospel. Till today, he's a big name in the Spanish world. And I do remember when he was our ugly duckling. He wouldn't let me play with him now. He's way, way, way above whatever I am. And when I looked at his life, this is what I found. I found somebody who was laser focused. He somehow understood this was the call of God for him. He's a worship leader. And every time I see him, I remember what I just told you. Just keep your eye on the prize. No matter how big the need gets, God will fulfill it. Sometimes yeah. in a flood and sometimes just in a trickle. Yep. But your eye is on the prize. It's not about tent making. It's about doing what God put you on this earth to do. God bless you. Amen. Good, good. Good. All right, praise the Lord.